last 12 years, uh, Bob Palmer has been the staff director, U.S. House of Representatives, Democratic Office of the Committee on Science. Uh, he spent the last 25 years for the House, with the House Science Committee. Uh, he first came to Washington in 1979 as a AAAS Congressional Science Fellow. Happy to hear that we have a member of the audience who's going to be at least taking the first steps as a Congressional Fellow next year. Bob has a bachelor's from Harvard in psychology, master's from Northeastern in biology, and a PhD from the University of Delaware in marine biology. Uh, before all of that, he worked for a year as a VISTA volunteer in the inner city uh, and on an Indian reservation. He also spent two years as a private detective and for several years as a researcher in marine biology. Today he's going to talk about science policy, though, although I'm sure there's some other things to hear. Those stories. So join me in welcoming Bob Palmer. Anyway, thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I have spent some time in Boulder over the years. Um, Roger mentioned I was in Vista. That was in 1967, and we actually trained in Denver and got up here occasionally. I think it was the first time I was, I was here. We've also been lucky enough in the Science Committee in the House, the last three members of Congress from this, this district actually served on the Science Committee. Tim Wirth was, was on the committee, then David Skaggs, and the current incumbent, uh, Mark Udall, is on the Science Committee. He's actually was most recently ranking Democratic member on the Technology and Environment Subcommittee. He's now, I believe, ranking uh, Democratic member on the Space Subcommittee in the House Science Committee. So that's useful, um, I think, for you guys. And I also recall being here in the mid-'80s um, when the whole Global Change Program was sort of getting kicked off. And there were a series of meetings that, I, I guess they were at NCAR, um, that involved scientists and people from what, Capitol Hill and some press people and a whole wide range of people. I remember one of these meetings, I think Jack Eddy and Francis Brotherton, I don't even know if they're still here, but they were kind of hosting this. And I remember a lengthy discussion about what do we call this new science, and, and it was an odd feeling sort of being in the room where this term global change actually, I think, originated in this meeting. This would have been when NASA had, had a big BIC, BIP program, International Geosphere and Biosphere program. Well, that doesn't work. That's too long. And uh, No, NASA had global habitability. That, didn't, that was too long. And so global change, well, a long discussion after about two hours. Yeah, let's go with, go with that. I think that's where that term actually was coined, or at least where the community decided to Stick with it. Um, anyway, as Roger said, I came to the Hill uh, as a AAAS fellow in 1979, and my first exposure to science policy was something called the Ocean Dumping Act, uh, which is pretty much what it sounds like. It, it regulates dumping of sewage, sludge, and waste in the ocean um, and, and attempts to regulate that in a way so people don't just dump dump their problems 12 miles offshore. Uh, our boss at the time was a guy named Jerry Ambro from New York. He was chairman of the Environment Subcommittee on the House Science Committee. And he had a problem, which is the dredge spoils in very dirty Connecticut harbors were being dumped out in the middle of Long Island Sound. And some of the residue was washing up onto the beaches of his constituents in, in New York. Um, so putting science to work, we solved this problem very simply. Uh, we simply amended the Ocean Dumping Act to declare that the Long Island Sound was, in fact, the ocean. Uh, this was a great surprise to Rand McNally at the time. Uh, but what it did is it brought the tougher ocean dumping regulations into play in the dredge spoil in the Sound and solved the problem for Mr. Ambro. And uh, about 20 years later, something similar happened when the Congress actually temporarily declared Lake Champlain to be a great lake. Those of you who remember that, that was not a permanent designation, but it did actually last for a while in law, as I recall. Um, the ocean dumping saga, after we redefined Long Island Sound, I then, as a young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed fellow, got to go to the second greatest deliberative body in the world, the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. And when a bill comes up on the floor, the members managing the bill stand by the doorways and members come in and, and what am I voting on? You know, so you know, I expected this long discussion about dredge spoil and contaminated lead and all this stuff. And now they'd worked it all out in advance and the members were at the doors and they were saying, vote yes for clean fish. <laughs> vote yes for clean fish. So 
I mean, oh, yeah, okay, I go stuck their card in, voted yes for clean fish. And <laughs> I was sitting there by the committee table, and these two guys were behind me, two members of Congress. And I've everybody been up in the gallery of the House. You know, there's a, a board up over the, over the chamber where it lists every member's name and how they vote in real time. So you can see actually how everyone's voted. And one guy looked up and turned to the guy next to him and said, you know you just voted for dirty fish? <laughs> <laughs> I goes, oh my God. So he takes his card out and punches it in and that bill passed, I think, 360 to 60 or something. So um, anyway, that was a very sobering initial exposure to the use of science and policy making. But <laughs> I, I survived it and actually another 25 years of it until I retired to Florida at the end of last year. I just moved down there in January, actually. Um, so I'm no longer on the Hill, and therefore I'd be free to be completely honest today. <laughs> I don't work for anybody up there. Uh, anyway, about six months ago, Roger Pokey uh, wrote an article entitled The End of Research, which dealt with federal funding for science. I'm taking this seriously, by the way. I actually wrote out a speech, which, so forgive me if I'm not making eye contact. I'm not used to doing this, but I took you guys seriously. So anyway, I'll, I'll read most of it. Roger concluded, quote, over the last decade, S&T has experienced, I think that's a typo, Rogers. S&T have experienced. <laughs> Picky here. But. Maybe you know better. Over the past decade, S&T has experienced the second golden age, at least as measured by federal funding, which has increased dramatically in recent years at a pace not seen since the 1960s. Uh, we, can, we can discuss science budgets later in the Q's and A's if you'd like, uh, but I'm going to use this talk to discuss a different question, which is if this is the golden age for S&T funding, is it also the golden age for science policy? Uh, we have some students here who are probably majoring in this or doing PhDs in it, and they may be interested in their career options. Um, and I'm not talking about today about the study of science policies in universities or think tanks, which, based on all the reading that Rad and Roger assigned to me, appears to be fairly vigorous and fairly healthy. Uh, but I'm asking the question whether it's a golden age for science policy as practiced at the federal level by the executive and legislative branches of our government. And whatever we conclude about science policy, it's clear we continue to have a lot of science <coughs> politics, uh, which I uh, was able to participate in fairly eagerly for about 25 years. And science politics, of course, consists of budget fights, creation of programs, tweaking of programs, oversight of programs, destruction of programs, philosophical disagreements of all sorts. It can be a very bloody sport. It can also be a lot of fun, uh, even though it's quite serious. Um, and even beyond science policy and politics, it's certainly true that the federal scientific enterprise continues to react to pressing social issues, as it did with the spikes in space and energy funding in the 60s and 70s, and more recently, the spike in homeland security funding. This is all obvious if you look at graphs of federal R&D funding over the years. But, and this is my main theme today, for many years, both in the executive and the legislative branches, there have been no consistent, there has been no consistent or focused debate about the roles of science and technology in meeting our broader national goals, as I believe there has been about the rightful place of many other aspects of our culture. To list a few where we do see regular debates uh, uh, in recent years, I think of things like abortion and abstinence, federal support of education, uh, the role of the military in promoting democracy around the world, the role of individual rights in a society threatened by terrorism, capital punishment. Um, the appropriate place for these and many other issues and tools and techniques are sifted and sorted all the time, often because they're seen by our political leaders, not always, but often because they're seen by our political leaders as fertile ground for drawing political differences between the two parties. But debates with, over issues which are less overtly political, uh, such as the debate about how to connect the conduct and goals of science with broader goals in society, just doesn't seem to be taking place, at least not in our national government. So regrettably, 
my depressing conclusion is that science policy isn't anything but a golden age right now. It is, in fact, rusty and stagnant. And engagement between the two branches and the two political parties is minimal. Uh, the great debates of the day are being held somewhere else, and to the extent they occur at all, science policy debates have gone very much underground. In short, it's a very, to me, boring and unproductive time for the practice of science policy in the halls of government. And for this conclusion, I apologize to any students here <laughs> uh, who are majoring in this. And I'll say also, if you want to accuse me of being a bitter, out-of-power Democrat, you're probably right, but I accept that criticism and it's, and it's, and it's accurate, but uh, it is nonetheless my grim conclusion. Um, now, in keeping them with the theme of this series, and I'm sort of an adjunct, uh, because of course, constitutionally, the Congress is an independent and separate branch and has an independent role in science policy, complementary to the executive, and you have several science, former science advisors coming um, here. I'm going to look at the roles of the executive branch and the Congress in setting science policy in the U.S., particularly uh, the degree of cooperation and conflict between the two over the last 25 years or so. And, um, of course, science advisors go back probably to the middle of the 20th century or to Jefferson, if you want to consider Meriwether Lewis a science advisor. Uh, but one of the early ones, Ed David, who I guess is appearing later in your series, was fired by President Nixon in 1973. And at the same time, Nixon abolished the Office of Science and Technology and the President's Science, Ad Science Advisory Committee, supposedly because Nixon, who was not the least paranoid president we've ever had, uh, felt he was getting bad advice from his scientific advisory apparatus on issues like the anti-ballistic missile treaty and the supersonic transfer airplane. <coughs> I'll be interested to see if Ed David agrees or disagrees with that. He probably doesn't agree with it. But at any rate, Gerald Ford, for you kids in the audience, he exceeded, succeeded Richard Nixon. Um, and he was a creature of the Congress. He'd been the House Minority Leader. Uh, Ford appeared to be genuinely eager to reinstate the role of the science advisor. Um, and that led a couple of years later in 1976 to passage of the National Science and Technology Policy Organization and Priorities Act which established, not only established a federal administrative organization for science policy, i.e. OSTP, which everyone in this series pretty much run, uh, has run at different points, except Ed David, he preceded it. Uh, the bill also attempted to articulate a science policy for the country, a very general one, but nevertheless, I think a serious effort to tie the nation's S&T enterprise to broader social goals. For example, the law declares that S&T should contribute to, quote, fostering leadership in the quest for international peace and progress towards human freedom, dignity, and well-being, unquote. Now, I was in grad school at the time, but I suspect the OSTP Act of 1976 was a true collaborative effort between a Republican administration and a Democratic Congress to restore some dignity and visibility to the Office of Science Advisor, which Nixon had abolished three years earlier when he canned Ed David. Uh, Vice President Nelson Rockefeller at the time pushed the bill and actually came up to uh, the committee that Rad and I used to work on and testified on the bill, which was pretty unprecedented to have a vice president come up to Congress and testify, given the sensitivity about separation of powers. Rad informs him was very carefully handled to make sure that no precedent was established uh, that could compel future vice presidents to have to testify on something else like their land deals or something. <laughs> uh, for example, the committee apparently did not actually invite Rockefeller. They welcomed him. <laughs> this is what Rad tells me. I'll have to defer to old timers like Rad to <laughs> confirm the events. Um, forgive me, uh, but you know the problem with <laughs> relying on Rad's memory, it reminds me, I play a lot of golf and <laughs> there's a there was a foursome of these old guys that used to play every Saturday morning, and, none, and only one of them could actually see anything. And uh, he up and died, of course. So they put a sign up in the locker room, elderly threesome looking for fourth, must have good eyesight. <laughs> so uh, the next Saturday, this, they're on the tee, and this guy shows up and said, I hear you need a fourth. And, 
I said, well, we sure do. You want to join? Yeah, I'd love to. I said, how's your eyes? I goes, 20-20. I said, great. First guy goes up and whacks the ball out in the fairway. They turn to, all turn to the guy. I said, did you see it? He goes, yep. I said, where'd it go? He said, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> so, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> That's rad. You still got perfect eyesight. <laughs> Um, anyway, I may be romanticizing this OSTP Act, but to me it seems to be the last really successful effort involving the legislative and executive branches to deal broadly, cooperatively with science policy in a very broad way, and that was almost 30 years ago. Since there, there have been a few largely abortive legislative efforts to catalyze a discussion of national science policy. Congressman George Brown Brad and I worked for him. Roger worked for Mr. Brown. He passed away in 1999. Uh, was probably the most successful at getting this discussion going in his role as, ch as chairman of the House Science Committee in the early 1990s. He was pretty legendary for constantly prodding the science community to engage in the political process and to think about and take responsibility for the impacts of their work. Um, and then there was a brief period in the beginning of the Clinton administration, 93, 94, or so when the government science resources were very overtly and consciously being redirected towards economic competitiveness. Um, and then in 95, when the Republicans assumed power in the Congress, with, they brought with them a new direction in science policy, which I will summarize perhaps unfairly in a nutshell as basic research good, everything else bad. Of course, these new leaders reserve the right to define basic research, which uh, <laughs> it turned out included such items as the space station and hydrogen research, which some of us may quibble with as being basic. Um, later in the 90s, Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich assigned Congressman Vern Ehlers, who was a former physicist. Some of you probably have met him or have heard him speak. Uh, the job of producing a new U.S. science policy. And Mr. Ehler did write a report entitled Unlocking Our Future Towards a New si National Science Policy. But that report, which I did read, uh, did not actually tie science policy to any overriding goals, in my opinion. And I actually cornered Mr. Gingrich one day after a speech and asked him what he thought of it because he'd commissioned the report. and He admitted it was a fairly timid endorsement of the status quo, as I think about the way he put it. Um, so we, we had, a in the beginning of the Bush administration, I guess the final thing I'd say about sort of science policy in various administrations is there was a, an effort to use GIPRA, the Government Performance and Research Results Act, to evaluate research, actually a lot of federal programs, including research programs. And um, I think that actually showed a lot of promise in terms of clarifying priorities and decision making and philosophical underpinnings of um, why we're funding R&D, um, focus on outco outcomes rather than outputs and all those magic words. I don't think it's lived up to that, and I find it kind of ironic actually these days that OSTP seems sort of constantly besieged about, no, we're not cutting the budget, we're raising the science budget, and they seem totally immersed again in these arguments about numbers. So I, I think that's a great tool or potentially a great tool. I don't think it's being used very well. Um, now, over the years, I have seen a lot of instances of productive cooperation between the administration and science advisors in the Congress, cooperation that uh, goes beyond cordial relations to actually joint discussion, formulation, planning, and implementation. These cases have all been pretty much issue-related rather than sweeping broad issues of science policy like the 1976 Act. In the lingo of atmospheric sciences, these uh, might be called mesoscale issues, which I think is a term you've used, so I apologize if I stole it. Uh, for example, the space station was under the threat of imminent demise through the early 90s, but was saved by one vote in the House in 1993. We had a discussion of that earlier today. And several times after that, by slightly larger margins, through a high degree of cooperation between the administration, some people in Congress, and industry lobbyists. I know the space station does not really qualify as science, but it's certainly technology and it's certainly sold as science, so I'll lump it into this category. Cooperation was very strong on broad questions of industrial policy. I mentioned that earlier, uh, both during the first Clinton campaign. We actually had 
the Democrats at the time had very close relations with the campaign, and certainly during the first two years of the Clinton administration. And as I mentioned, this involved the creation and nurturing of an alphabet soup of competitiveness programs um, that work through joint industry, government, R&D funding, things like the Advanced Technology Program in the Department of Commerce to create, generate new technologies, uh, the Manufacturing Extension Program in the same department, um, which is an extension program for small high-tech businesses. It also included the Technology Reinvestment Program, which was aimed at converting defense resources and facilities to civilian purposes. That was a big deal then as the defense budgets were going down. Expanded CRADAs, cooperative R&D agreements between industry and, and government, multiplied by a factor of several during that time. Um, U.S. CAR, which was a CRADA between the federal government and the big three auto companies. And some of these, like the uh, U.S. CAR, were actually quite controversial. Uh, environmentalists criticized it as a sellout to the big three who were let off the hook on tougher emission standards in return for their participation in this massive R&D program. Uh, there was also pretty good cooperation between the OSTP of Bush 1 and the Democratic Congress in passing the Global Change Research Act in 1989 and 1990, for those of you that work in that area. Some elements in Congress and the administration fought it, but uh, the opposition was overcome and it was enacted. There was also good cooperation between Bush and the Congress first Bush and industry lobbyists in protecting the superconducting super collider down in Texas. And there wasn't broad congressional agreement on that, but at least there was open, vigorous debate. And the debate, of course, ultimately led to the demise of the SSC and a vote on the floor of the House in 1993. Uh, finally, in the early Clinton years, there was again, again a lot of discussion between the branches on the space station and specifically the role that the Russians were going to play on the space station. Vice President Gore and others in the administration had frequent interactions with congressional leaders. Um, in the end, the station continued, although the Congress did disagree with the administration on whether or not the Russians should be part of the critical path in the station. The Russians were put in the critical path, which simply means the station couldn't be built or maintained without the Russians. And the Congress actually didn't support that decision, but 10 years later after the Columbia accident and uh, after the U.S. space flight program became completely dependent upon Russia, that decision alone probably has saved the station from crashing into the Pacific Ocean long ago. Now, what do these uh, sort of mesoscale things have in common? Again, other than OSTP, they're all sort of these mesoscale issues. They deal with a limited aspect of science policy. Secondly, they proceeded through regular order with hearings, congressional action, congressional floor debate, floor votes, regular consultation and discussion. In other words, their resolution was fairly transparent and democratic. And thirdly, they were all resolved more than 10 years ago. Do I see any of this bipartisan government-wide engagement now? The answer is virtually none, not even at the mesoscale level. And my reason is that perhaps my overly partisan view of things, you guys can be the judge of that, the problem really started in the late 80s when S&T became very politicized in Congress. In my mind, as part of a broader strategy by Republicans to seize back control of the Congress, which they, in fact, succeeded in doing in 1994. Now, they weren't going to seize it back on science policy, don't get me wrong, but um, it was part of a larger picture. Some of you may or may not know that the um, public partisan fight over science policy, which is exemplified today by Congressman Waxman's reports and the Union of Concerned Scientists reports, as most of you are probably aware of, uh, didn't start in this administration. It really began going on in the Hill about 15 years ago. Um, and these aren't fights on science-specific issues like in the early 80s we had a big fight on the Clin Clinch River Breeder Reactor. That was not a partisan fight. But partisan fights were largely non-existent, as I said, until the late 80s. And Newt Gingrich, I think, ironically, was kind of the, the guy behind this. Um, Gingrich is now a very outspoken and I find very entertaining speaker on behalf of science and science policy. But at the time, he was fighting for leadership of the House Republican Party, and he was stirring up his followers in the House to um, fight the Democrats on basically everything, including science. It became a much more combative atmosphere. And I can go into specifics on this, but suffice it to say that we fought on 
all sorts of issues and with a real spirit of meanness that I hadn't seen for decades, I guess. Um, I've mentioned in some talks I've given that I actually saw a Gingrich speak down at AAAS in around 2000 or 2001. He gave a breakfast speech, and I found it one of the most entertaining and energized speeches on science policy. He was linking science funding with international relations, with health care, with economic competitiveness, thinking very big thoughts, some of which I didn't agree with, but thinking big thoughts about why are we doing science and coming up with some very intriguing answers. And it, um, to me, it's a, a great irony that Gingrich, who probably loves talking about science policy more than any public figure since Mr. Brown, caused a lot of these partisan problems. But he, he did, in my view. Um, now, one of the casualties of the new partisanship that we started seeing 10, 15 years ago was the difficulty of passing legislation. Um, we've had one NASA, I was talking to Noel earlier about this, we've had one NASA authorization bill enacted in the last 12 years, which was in the year 2000. Um, and authorization bills are supposed to set policy for the agency for the next several years. When Rad was on the Hill working in space issues in the 70s and 80s, it was quite common for a NASA bill to pass the Congress every year, or at least every Congress, every two years. Um, I remember the NASA bill of 1994, and we didn't get a bill. And in retrospect, we probably should have just rammed it through. But we didn't. We had talks and talks and talks, and we dragged on. And finally, late in the session, all of the issues in that bill were worked out at a substantive level. But the Republicans in the House, you basically used every trick in the book to keep the bill from getting enacted at the end of the session. Why? Because their playbook at the time called for running against, running a national election against a do-nothing, corrupt Democratic Congress. And even a little NASA bill on which there was no substantive disagreement wasn't allowed to pass. Um, and it worked. They won the election. So. Um, the current situation in space policy and space legislation is actually quite instructive in that regard. I think there's been a lot of interest among Republican leaders in Congress to pass a space policy bill for three or four years now, but there's also fear that they don't have the votes to pass the president's space vision. The combination of skeptical Democrats who sound more and more like Republicans when I was growing up about the deficit, um, and a lot of Republicans who are getting there's a wing of the Republican Party in the House that's getting more and more hawkish on deficits. Um, I think worry the leaders in the House that they just don't have the votes. So those who control the congressional agenda, or at least the House agenda, like the ethically challenged Tom DeLay from Texas, who has the Johnson Space Center in his district, work their miracles behind closed doors and the money flows. So. Probably the most significant changes to our civilian space policy in 20, 30, or 40 years are moving forward, but there are actually no votes, no public debate, no real democracy on any of this. Uh, it may change this year. The, old chair, the chairman of my old committee, Mr. Bullard, is to want to do a NASA bill, um, and I think he's very sincere about that. I'll believe it when I see it. If they don't think they have the votes, they're not going to move it. Now, the situation in my mind was much healthier 12 years ago when the fate of the super collider was determined by an open, transparent floor vote, floor votes in the House and the Senate. At least there was a debate. Or at least 20 years ago, when the Congress declared that commercial and foreign uses of the space shuttle, users of the space shuttle, should pay exactly $74 million for each launch, literally that number, rather than the real average cost of more than, well, I don't know what it was in the time. Today it's certainly $500 million or more dollars. That was a pretty foolish policy, which by establishing an artificial and very low price, discouraged alternative access to space and put our country in a real hole after the Challenger accident. But at least the decision was made in the open through a transparent process amenable to discussion, amendment, and democracy, even though the result wasn't all that attractive. The process was all right. Um, this, the corrosive effect of this partisanship on resolving public policy issues is not limited to space policy or science policy. Environmental legislation has also pretty much ground to a halt over the last 10 to 12 years. Significant environmental policy is now made through executive orders or is surreptitiously inserted into legislative riders rather than through the regular order that we read about in the civics books. Why is this? Well, one, it's easier. Um, and two, because when important environmental provisions are slipped into massive pieces of legislation at the last minute, uh, 
Members of Congress don't have to answer for their public votes from a politically active environmental community. In 95, when the new Republican leaders in the House charged ahead right to work passing their contract with America on which they'd run, the pattern, uh, contract was a number of procedural and uh, substantive policies that were the centerpiece of the election strategy in 94. One of the items was called the Risk Assessment and Cost Benefit Act of 1995, known as the Regulatory Reform Act in the Senate. A very sweeping bill which superseded provisions of many environmental statutes passed in the previous 25 years. It whip, whisked through the House with about five Republican defections and probably 20 Democrats voting for it. Um, but due to pressure from a wide range of public interest, interest groups, the bill stalled in the Senate. And members in the House who had voted for this bill heard from their constituents, and within about a year, for a variety of reasons, it was no longer five, but it was about 30 to 40 Republicans who regularly defected in the House from party orthodoxy on key environmental votes. You can just watch the numbers creep up over the course of the year. And this rate of defection was not tolerable to the leadership in the House, so environmental legislation simply stopped moving and went underground. Within the next few years, the Data Quality Act and the Data Access Act were both slipped into omnibus appropriations bills with little debate or discussion. Industry lobbyists bragged they had accomplished much more by slipping in these two provisions under the cloak of darkness than they had ever anticipated achieving in 1995 through regular order. One of the results of these bills are the so-called peer review regulations, which are bumping their way through uh, the process right now. Now, this approach to governments, governance, of course, does take some casualties, namely transparency, accountability, and democracy, in my view. Um, uh, a final casualty of this incre increasing partisanship to me is congressional oversight. It's one of the most important institutional roles for the Congress overseeing the executive branch and, his op and its operations. I remember working with Ray Adnoll, would remember this in the early 80s on the future of the Landsat program. And we had learned that OMB had hatched a plan to turn over the nation's weather and land remote sensing satellites to a private company, ComSat, in a non-competitive sweetheart deal. We also learned that the Deputy Secretary of Commerce, don't ask me how we learned this, but we did. We also learned the Deputy Secretary of Commerce, Guy Fisk, who was responsible for the decision, was at the same time negotiating in private to become the new Chief Executive Officer of ComSat. The clearest, most blatant conflict of interest I've ever seen in 25 years of government. And he didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Um, the members we worked for at the time blew the lid off the deal the deputy secretary was fired by Malcolm Baldridge, the secretary, who was appalled when he found out, to Mr. Baldridge's credit. And in the long run, the Landsat and Weather Satellite programs were allowed to continue as government programs. In this instance, patting us on the back here, Rad, I think Congress fulfilled its oversight responsibilities quite, quite well. Today, on the other hand, a highly disciplined Republican Congress, in my view, conducts virtually no oversight on the Republican administration. The list of issues that should be examined is long. In many cases, I believe that people like the old chairman of my old committee, Mr. Bullard, would love to examine some of these issues, but orthodoxy is pretty strictly enforced, and he doesn't generally do it. Um, whatever one may think about the issue, for instance, we have had no public debate, for example, on the issue of misuse of science or science integrity, whether you think it's important, not important, overblown incredibly important. We just don't get a debate on it. Actually, as an aside, we, the Democrats in the Science Committee actually invited, set up a, quote, hearing, unquote, because we can't convene hearings, but you can convene an event that looks like a hearing, smells like a hearing, and invited uh, Dr. Marburger and the Union of Concerned Scientists to appear before us in this hearing-like format to discuss this broader issue. And of course, the White House declined on several occasions to do that. They were perfectly happy to let the issue go away. Um, but we don't see oversight hearings on a lot of things. Um, we've talked for years about looking at the impact of commercialization on universities by the Bayh-Dole Act and other intellectual property provisions. Um, I had a bugaboo for a long time, a lot of people did, about what I consider to be the militarization of our civilian space program. Um, or the administration's weak response to cybersecurity issues, or NASA's financial management problems, which continue. Uh, 
or the new peer review rules that I mentioned earlier. Um, none of those have had a hearing. Um, as Rad used to tell me when I was a young whippersnapper, if you want to see where the science policy issues are, pick up an issue of Science Magazine and read it. And that's usually a pretty good barometer of what people are talking about and thinking about out there. And most of the issues that are in there, you don't see any hearings on. Um, so anyway, assuming you buy my argument that an increasingly partisan, corrosive atmosphere in Washington has affected even the pursuit of science policy, what does it matter? I mean, science will certainly perk along, uh, buoyed by tens of billions of dollars of federal funding and by, I heard, uh, read Dr. Marburger's speech about this sort of inviolent 11% of all funding goes to science. So why worry, right? You're going to get 11%. And perhaps in the end, science policy will benefit from flying under the radar screen, immersed in the incremental budget machinations that uh, return to Washington every spring, as faithfully as the buzzards to Hinckley. I had to put that in. I grew up in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, and every March 15th, the buzzards returned to Hinckley, Ohio, right down the road, four days before the gulls returned or the swallows to Capistrano. So. Anybody doing climate research, you might want to document the arrival of the buzzards at Hinckley. <laughs> it's about the time the federal budget gets digested. Um, anyway, the reason I think science and tech policy matters and the problem with this view of just sort of letting things go along is that the world is changing very quickly. And science and technology have to be key in helping us understand and respond to this. Um, and I was thinking, preparing this, how the policy as an environment has changed in the last seven or eight years. In the 90s, we were deeply concerned about how to reinvest the budgetary peace dividend that we were going to get at the end of the Cold War, and then later about how we were going to invest the federal surplus. You all remember those worries? Today we have the largest defense budgets and among the largest federal deficits in history. A little bit of a change. We also have the challenge of terrorism and the threat of attacks on our own soil from weapons of mass destruction. Healthcare costs continue to spiral upward, threatening our small businesses and our future fiscal stability, despite our massive expenditures on health research, which only seem to exacerbate the problem. We face an increasingly competitive and capable Asia whose current ability to challenge our manufacturing base, even our high-tech manufacturing base, even our R&D base, seems limitless. Um, offshoring of more and more technical jobs is inevitable. Nobody can really say with confidence where the jobs or future are going to come from in this country. Um, will our science strength mean we will just out-innovate the rest of the world, as a lot of optimists seem to think? Does that mean then that all the creative work will remain here in the U.S. and all the manufacturing jobs will go somewhere else, be outsourced somewhere else? If so, do we need, does that mean we need more or fewer scientists? Who knows? I don't know. Um, and as our new competitors, particularly China and, and India, continue their rapid development, we will continue to see bottlenecks in the global production and distribution of all sorts of raw materials reflected today in the price of gasoline at the pump, uh, the availability of building materials in my new home state of Florida, which are very hard to come by because of demand from Asia for wallboard and concrete, things like that. Anyway, none of these challenges are going to be solved by science, but they all will require wise application of science. And my concern is that in an increasingly partisan environment, they won't even get serious consideration. Uh, because of concern about partisan advantage and because of a political culture which makes it increasingly difficult to reach across, across party and ideological barriers. I would mention here, and I really don't want to pick on Dr. Marburger, who's a, a gentleman and a very intelligent fellow, but just as an example of this partisanship, I will mention this. Uh, when he was confirmed three and a half, four years ago, normally the process is you know, new guys women that get confirmed to high positions come up and visit with the congressional committees. Uh, by the time I left, the, when, I, when I left the Hill at the end of the last year, Mr. Marger, Marburger had actually, Dr. Marger had actually not visited the senior Democrat in the Science Committee once, uh, which I found sort of unbelievable. The last Republican science advisor, Alan Bromley, who unfortunately passed away here in the last month or so, 
was virtually a fixture of our committee offices. We saw Bromley <laughs> all the time. Uh, and I don't blame Marburger for this. I think he's getting advice from the White House that Democrats simply don't matter and don't waste your time up there. And I've actually never seen this kind of behavior, and I don't fault him for it. But I think it's a shame and it's kind of a reflection of the partisanship that's going on right now. He's getting bad staffing. Um, an example, I'm kind of wrapping up here, an example of an issue that could use some creative, nonpartisan, scientific, and political thinking um, as an example. Consider for a minute the example of comprehensive energy legislation, which has been bumping around the Congress for the last six years now. Hasn't been enacted, but it may be this year. Uh, any 10-year-old knows that for a myriad of good reasons, we need to do a much better job in this country of conserv conserving energy and re reducing our reliance on imported oil and gas. This is not hard to figure out. I can't imagine a current crisis that calls out more clearly for political leadership than this one. <coughs> I'm a big fan of Robert Caro's books on LBJ. I don't know if any of you have read them. I have some historians in the office. But I, I love the recent one, Master of the Senate. Um, which is all about Lyndon Johnson and the passage of the 1958 Civil Rights Act. There were civil rights acts before 1964, as it turns out. And I wonder what a leader of this, with the skills of Lyndon, Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson would have done facing this situation, energy situation. Perhaps, I thought, he would have brokered a deal that allowed increased oil and gas exploration in the U.S., offshore and or in Alaska, but only in combination with, which is to say in return for, much more stringent vehicle efficiency standards. Uh, this deal would offend a lot of people, a lot of powerful interests, but it certainly would produce significant results, environmental results, economic results, and national security results within a decade. And the shame today is not that this isn't enacted, but that nobody even conceives of these sorts of compromises. Um, the political leadership is lacking. The partisan barriers are too deep. Uh, if we did have an LBJ driving for a political consensus on the issue of energy dependence, science and technology would be freed up to provide a myriad of possible solutions and a wealth of information to inform binding political negotiations and compromises. Without this leadership, science is doomed to remain on the sideline because there's no way science can solve the problem by itself. So in conclusion here, I, my conclusion is that your federal government, not mine anymore, but all of ours, is not responding very well to the many political challenges of the day, energy, environment, health care, global economic competition, whose resolution would greatly benefit from wise application of science and technology. Um, I'm going to quote Otto Bismarck anyway, who said that, 1867, politics is the art of the possible. He didn't go on to say science can help us define what is possible, but that is also true. And when politics is overly fettered by partisanship, so is science, in the sense that its legitimate role in opening up more room for negotiations and options is severely limited. And that's unfortunately what I see as the niche for science policy today. And again, I apologize for being so bleak and black and Depressing. Um, I just retired in Florida. I should have a happier message, but uh, can I tell you it's the water down there. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate being here. The question is whether um, agency scientists or agency heads testifying in Congress um, have had to modify their testimony as a result of uh, their political leaders in the administration before they give it. Uh, the answer is, of course, that's gone on from probably the administration of George Washington. Um, I guess there have been a few somewhat publicized cases of people who have spoken their mind and in some cases lost their jobs doing that. Um, I don't really have a problem with that uh, because I think you do work for your president and you serve at the leisure of the president. Uh, you know, if it, if, it, if it goes over a certain line where people are are lying or distorting facts. That's, of course, another matter. But um, heads of agencies are not, are not free spirits, and they're not independent agents. And so I would expect them to be generally loyal. Uh, committees, it depends on the relationship. You know, the, the 
there is this very close relationship between congressional committees and the agencies. And a lot of times the entire raison d'etre for the committee is that they have this agency to oversee and uh, nurture and take care of, and they look at it that way. Um, I think the small, small business committees in the House and Senate are kind of like that. You know, they're really, their job is to protect their turf, which means protect the small business committee. So they have very close relations, and they, they probably in a lot of those cases they get the testimony. They might get an agency scientist or even the head of an agency, listen, I can't say this, but why don't you ask me in the question period about the following. Uh, but those relationships are not always that cozy by any means. And I, I never regarded when I was on the Hill that my job was to be NASA's spokesman or DOE spokesman. You know, my job, I work for an independent branch of government. My job was to try to help the members get some information so they can make an intelligent decision. And if I saw something going on, I thought it was really stupid to, to call it out and try to stop it. And, you know, in lots of cases to try to collaboratively help an agency achieve what they wanted to help. But that was not by any means the only reason. Um, so I think it's it's been going on a long time. Whether the it's hard for me to say whether there's more or less because OMB, Office of Management and Budget, but usually has the final word on testimony, doesn't usually send it down for my perusal. So I, I don't have much of a way of knowing how much have changed. And I got kind of bored about 10 years ago trying to figure out who was getting changed and who wasn't. It's just you never get to the end of that rope. Question is, with the new space vision in NASA, aeronautics funding seems to be suffering. And what's the view on the Hill about aeronautics funding in NASA? There's a very vocal, small but vocal constituency, which tends to represent, be around the, the centers in NASA that conduct aeronautical research. And you know what they are, Cleveland and Langley and California and so forth. Um, they have been very active and, you know, slightly successful in altering those budgets in recent years. This has been going on for quite a while. There's um, intense awareness among interested members that Airbus is eating our lunch. Um, but, you know, we're also down to one company. And so I think the, the funding for aeronautics to a certain degree has probably been hurt by the fact that it's really the government working for one company, Boeing. And nobody else, I mean, I, you know, we don't produce commuter airlines in this 50-seat commuter airlines, and we, don't, we only have one company, um, which kind of, I think, in a way, for some members, makes them think this is really industrial policy. We shouldn't be handing out a billion dollars a year to Boeing. I think that never comes out overtly, but I think that's in the back of some members' minds. So... Um, yeah, I, I see a lot. Europe has this plan, you know, Aviation 2010 or something, which lays out their goal for basically dominating commercial aviation sales in the next decade or two. And members are intensely aware of that and wave it around um, and are pretty well aware of the subsidy issue and so forth. But in the end, it's like a lot of issues where you have a fairly small, geographically small group of highly concerned members that have their fingers in the dike but don't change the overall direction. And given the pressure of the vision, the budgetary pressure, I don't really see that let, uh, letting up much. There's another grim answer for you. Sorry. <laughs> Question is, Senate uh, language in the last year or two years? Two years ago. Two years ago um, seem to take a direct shot at the NOAA laboratories and their organization and structure uh, here in Boulder and what was the basis of that. Um, I can't shed a lot of light on it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, one thing I have learned over the years is, is uh, the frightening power of one or two appropriations staff people. Mr. Brown, when we used to work for him, who in his life lost one election, which was the California Senate race in 1970. And he was a mayor and a state representative and elected to Congress 18 times. So he'd won 26 or 27 elections that the people had elected him to. It drove him nuts that one unelected appropriation staffer, as he put it, had more power than he did. And the reality is that's often the truth. And it's almost, I think, you know, the appropriation staffers as a rule are 
are very bright, and they also, a lot of times, depending on their bosses and what kind of a leash they have them on, um, have the ability to, to um, indulge their vendettas, whatever the reason may be. I try to get down to the bottom of that because Mr. Udall is on our committee. You know, he heard about it. He was very concerned about it. Um, we actually got the inspector general to do a study of this, which was pretty transparently designed to just slow things up so we could figure out what to do next. Uh, and we worked with Udall on a number of things like that to kind of slow this up and get others interested and engaged to try to figure out what was at the bottom of it. Um, in the end, you had a senator on the Senate Appropriations Committee, you know, that I would have gone to and said, here's our problem. But maybe that was a circuitous route. Um, I don't know, and if I'd gone over and asked, I probably wouldn't have gotten a straight answer, but it was, I mean, I, I've seen over the years, you know, we had a discussion this morning about um, pork in federal R&D budgets, and, you know, there's a certain level beyond which you just sort of gag that this has gone overboard. I think it, that level was reached for me when I started seeing staff pork, where actual staff members in the, in the Senate Appropriations Committee were directing money to their alma maters because they could. I mean, that's way over the line. And the only way to really stop it, we discussed this this morning with pork, it's almost the same thing here. Um, sweet reason doesn't usually work. Um, you know, my approach to a problem like that would be to try to figure out what the source of the problem is. If it's not a member, and it may have been in this case, I don't honestly know. Um, you know, I would try my best to find a member, a senator, to kick that staff person in the butt real hard so they don't forget. Uh, I don't know how else to do it. You're not going to sit down and reason. You're not going to say, I've worked for NOAA for 41 years. It's a great organization. Trust me. They don't, they don't want to listen to you. So I, I, uh, I empathize with you. Question is, in many areas, we appear to be losing our global scientific leadership. And if we ask leaders in Washington, D.C., what they think of this, what would they say? And the threat on the economy. And the threat on the economy. Um, that's a, a complicated question. <laughs> um, I mean, we could start with the notion that we're losing leadership. Um, measured how? You know, I mean, certainly, there are easy ways to judge well, okay, you can try to benchmark our certain fields against our competition around the world. But, you know, you've got to remember in the, in the 1950s, we had no competition. And even into the 70s, I mean, other areas of the world are developing, and this is a positive development. Um, there are probably... I don't know. There are probably five times as many basic research papers coming out of Asia today than there were 20 years ago. Yeah, that's how it would and I don't, you know, I don't know that. I, yes, you could call it a threat. You could also call it the natural evolution of humanity, and it's great that it's happening. So, um, you know, the Academy of Sciences had their report they came out with. I think Frank Press, who's not part of this series, came out with this notion that we should be the leader in some fields and right at the top and everything else, which to me was meaningless. On top to do, to accomplish what? Um, so, um, and, and the, other, the other, other reason it's a complicated question is the linkage between that leadership and economic output, which again is a wildly complicated question. I mean, Japan in the 80s, when we were afraid they were going to run the world, was not the leader in basic science by any means. They were the leader in applying science and organizing science. And um, we had a virtual mass hysteria in this country over what the Japanese economy was going to do to our economy. So if you're talking purely basic research, I think it's somewhat difficult to make it clean argument that this equates with economic progress 30 years down the road. There's so many other variables that intercede between basic research and um, economic dominance. Um, I think on the other hand, members of Congress are 
nonetheless, despite all those provisos I gave you, are sympathetic to that argument to a certain degree. It doesn't by itself guarantee that the superconducting super collider is going to get funded. But that was sold as we need to remain at the forefront of basic science in physics. And if we don't, it's going to go elsewhere. And in fact, it is going elsewhere. It's going to Geneva, at least for a while. It's probably it's there now, the leadership in that field. Um, at that time, it was difficult, and I suspect it would be still difficult, to convince members that somehow having the most powerful particle physics machine in Geneva necessarily translates to diminished economic performance 20 or 30 years from now. Uh, I don't think it's that simple. But hey, members are politicians. They like to feel that we're number one in everything. And there is some resonance to that argument. But as a policy, as a policy argument, I think it's much more complicated than that. Good questions. Uh, to, the, to a certain degree, it's the appropriations committees. Um, because in the end, NASA has to get a, some money. So every federal agency has to have an appropriation bill that funds it. Uh, those are the must-pass bills. Virtually everything else other than raising the debt ceiling and a few other things are kind of optional coursework. You know, you don't have to pass them. Appropriations bills have to pass. What's happened, I think because, of, as I mentioned, this partisan environment and also for the reasons I said, that I think people feel they don't necessarily have the votes to, you know, to pass the president's vision. Um, they're just doing it underground, and it's getting it's getting done through the appropriations process. Now, as you know, I don't recall off the top of my head, but most years of late, there's one big appropriations bill at the end of the year, omnibus, and there's uh, 13. Um, subcommittees on appropriations, and usually not all 13 of those bills get rolled into the omnibus, but five or six or eight or ten of them do. And almost always the VA HUD bill gets rolled in there because it's contentious because of veterans funding and, and other things, and that's where the NASA budget up until this year has been. So typically it's not only that it's not on the floor debated in the appropriations process where at least you'd have a you know kind of an open debate on it there, it sort of appears at the end in this big, massive thing that nobody can amend. There's maybe an hour or two to debate it, and it's rolled in there with all these other bills, and it's kind of just worked out behind, you know, behind closed doors by the powers that be. Um, that's been the that's been the situation quite commonly for the last <coughs> ten years, except as I said in the year 2000 when there was a, a bill. And that bill should be the one that sets the policy that talks about um, not only priorities at NASA, but program management, philosophy, all those good things. Um, and it just, you know, it happens now. And this is one of the frustrating things. All of us, I said, that worked up in the Hill here, we, wor we worked on an authorizing committee. And, and supposedly the authorizing committees are supposed to be the experts because they have more staff and more members to go more in depth to the programs and do the oversight. And the appropriations committees cover much more and they basically fund the programs. So they should be theoretically coming to us for advice. We had this discussion earlier today about the relative strength of the authorizing appropriation, how it waxes and wanes with time. The reality and what's so frustrating is appropriations doesn't typically have to listen to us, to the authorizing committees, so that the and often it's not even the members in the appropriations <laughs> committees that are behind a lot of the things. It's well-informed generally, but staffers with their own agendas writing things in committee reports. And appropriations committees reports, to the shock of everyone in this room perhaps, are not law. They do not have the force of law. But if, you, you know, if you're in an agency and you don't treat it as law, heaven help you because a ton of bricks is going to come down on your head. But it isn't law. And the problem there, and this is, this is not just the last three or four or five years. This has gone on forever. The problem there is there's no way to amend a report on the floor of the house or whatever. So a staffer writes in, Noah's management at Boulder is awful. <laughs>
the, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope, blah, 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 in the report language. And NASA, I mean, there's always the opportunity to go back and from NASA's perspective and try to renegotiate these things through the operating plans and so forth. But heaven help you if you don't comply with it. And that's what's, I mean, I had a good 25-year run up there, and at times it was refreshingly democratic, and it made you really proud, you know, that people had access to the system. And at other times, stuff got done like this, and it just made you sick. And it's always going to be that way, I guess. Um, but it's a mixed bag, and that's, that's kind of why, if it, you know, in the end, as I was saying earlier, it's two, the magic number is 218. That's half the House of Representatives, half of 435. If you got 218 votes, you can do something. And my assessment of NASA right now is they don't think they have 218. For, probably for any, any package they could put together. Now, that's the function of the legislative process is to figure out how you get to 218 and bring the various parties together. But, um, you know, there's not a lot of discussion. I, I happened to, I had the uh, good fortune, I guess you'd say, when the administration, after the Columbia accident, when the administration went off to think about space policy, and they ultimately came back with the president's vision. Um, and I wasn't expecting too much in terms of our members being folded in, but the Republican leadership in our committee was going crazy because they weren't getting any access to the administration's thinking on any of this, and they felt like they should be included. And so finally, the vice president came up to the Hill, and, um, and he met with all the leaders of the House and the Senate in, you know, in one room, and he was the point, point guy on where the space policy was going. This was probably two months before it got released. And uh, so we were all sitting in the room, or I was standing in the back more accurately. And Mr. Cheney said, well, got to come up with a space policy. What do, you, what do you all think? So they went around the room. Every member had five minutes. And they had about 10 members there, all the leaders of the House and Senate that cared about space. Um, and they went around the room one after the other, and they each got their five minutes. Cheney nodded, didn't take a note, but he had two or three horse holders behind him, and they were all writing all this stuff down. And then at the end, he looked up and he said, well, thank you very much for your views. I'm definitely going to consider those. <laughs> and as far as I know, that was the only interaction between the executive branch and the Congress on the new space policy. And I, I think I know this because I was pretty, pretty close to... Uh, the Republican leadership on our committee, and they were, they can correct the record if they want, but my, my impression was they didn't really get much more guidance or, or interaction than that on where this ought to be going. And Cheney certainly didn't tip his hand about where it should be going. Now, having said that, I don't think it's the stupidest policy I've ever seen. I think they had to do something with the shuttle and the station, and they've done something. You can't fly the shuttle and the station forever. And they did, they're doing it in an incremental way that might make some sense, but there's a million, obviously a million questions associated with that, not the least of which, what, what does it do to the rest of the agency and where in the hell are you going to find the money? Because you know it'll cost four times as much as they say. Um, Mike Griffin, to me, is a breath of fresh air, and um, hopefully he'll get his arms around it. He's very candid and very smart fellow. The question is, what do you do about all this partisanship, which seems to infect the process and make, make it difficult to get anything done, including science policy. That's a 20-word summary, but I know what you're asking. Um, you know, one of the ironies of this, I think, is that I, I think technology has caused some of this problem. Um, <clears throat> there's the technology of airplanes, which members go home. We were talking about this walking over today, but members pretty much come to Washington now for two days they come in Tuesday afternoon, have some votes, work on Wednesday, have some votes on Thursday, fly home Thursday night. So I would guess Mark Udall's average work week in Washington is two days. Um, and, you know, airplanes aren't exactly new, but uh, members don't know each other anymore. Um, you know, and I'm sounding like a wistful old fool, but I think that was different in the old, you know, in the old, certainly 
I knew guys when I got up there in the hill who, um, and this, this, they were chiefs of staff, say, in the 50s and 60s. One guy I know very well, he, his boss came from Seattle, and he said every year, you know, he and his boss would pile in their car in Seattle, and they'd drive to Washington, D.C., and they'd spend whatever it was, six or eight months in Washington. Then they'd pile in their car, and they'd drive back to Seattle. So he was in D.C. for eight months. He never flew home. And the members got to know each other much, much better. Um, they don't know each other anymore. The, the other technology that's kind of interesting, has a little impact on this to me, is um, all the computing power and the GIS power and all that stuff enables you to redistrict any damn way you want in about three seconds, any state in the country. So, you know, if you have a one seat edge in the state house and the state senate, you can draw your seats in that state. And what ends up happening is, of course, you know, Democrats and Republicans both do it. And you want to concentrate your opponent's votes in small districts. You want to spread yours out so you win 58% of 12 districts and they win 96% of two districts. And you dilute their power. And of course, African Americans are talking about this constantly. I have a friend I went to college with, Bobby Scott, who represents first black congressman from Virginia since Reconstruction. Hell of a guy. And they, re they redistricted him last time to raise his proportion of African Americans in his district from 43% to 68%. He said, I don't want them. <laughs> he said, I got elected to the state senate in a majority white district. You know, I don't need any of this. So this technology is so powerful now, what you end up with is, you know, states basically electing a lot of and these standards change over time, but to simplify the discussion, electing a bunch of liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans, and there are fewer and fewer people in the middle. And part of that is just re the way redistricting is done, and part of that's a function of the technology. Um, and you ask anybody, how, you know, how many moderate Republicans were there 30 years ago, and how many moderate Democrats, and you know, it's probably a factor of three to what's there now. Why is that? I don't entirely know. Some of it is this redistricting. Some of it is kind of demonization of the other side and the fact that these tactics tend to work. Um, unfortunately, part of it is the members just don't know each other as well. Um, I remember even in the, uh, when I first got to the Hill, Al Gore ran our investigations and oversight subcommittee, and he was pretty darn good. And his ranking Republican was Bob Walker who later was Gingrich's best friend and about as partisan as you can possibly get, and chairman of the Science Committee. Well, back 25 years ago, Gore was doing these hearings. He'd either do a hearing on the internet and some blue sky thing, or he'd do a hearing just bashing the hell out of the Reagan administration. It was nothing in the middle. It was one or the other. He liked the future stuff, and he loved bashing people. And he was good at both of them. And when he was doing the bashing hearings, Walker would come in and would defend the administration. And they'd go hammer and tong in the hearings, but you go back in the back offices and they'd, you know, they'd go back and get a cup of coffee or something, take a break. They were laughing and joking and they knew they were playing a role and they were doing what they were doing, but they didn't take it personally. It's gotten more personal. And I don't, I don't know, in, you know entirely why that is other than it works. The question is, how's the change in, in demographics of the House, that is more women and minorities um, affecting the operation of the Congress? Um, it definitely has increased. I think the African-American representation has kind of hit a sort of a semi-steady state at somewhere around 40 members, I believe, in the House. Um, you're right, the number of women members continues to increase. Um, on both sides of the aisle. The, obviously, the African-American members, I think, currently are all Democrats. Um, there was a member from Connecticut who was Republican, but he's gone. Um, Hispanic members are increasing. There are not nearly as many as um, African-American members at this point in time. They are on both sides of the aisle. More Democrats, except in Florida, there's more Republicans because of the Cuban-American community. And that community drives some issues on the floor of the House. Some of the Cuban issues are 
raise because of those members. Um, you know, again, I think not all, but many of the minority members tend to be on the liberal end of the spectrum in the Democratic Party. We were talking earlier about the Judiciary Committee which in the House, which deals with all the social policy, abortion, you know, gun rights, um, you know, run the, the, the Patriot Act, run the list, all the, all the, um, all those sorts of hot, hot button issues go through the Judiciary Committee, and that committee has gotten to be almost totally polarized between liberal, generally minority Democrats and ultra conservative Republicans, because <laughs> those are the issues those groups are interested in, and it makes it somewhat difficult to get things done. Although I told a interesting anecdote about the Patriot Act earlier today. I won't repeat it, but um, so, um, you know, I think in terms of the Democratic caucus, I think the Republican dream is always to drive a wedge between the more conservative members of the Democratic caucus who, and actually if you, demographically, one thing that's interesting is trying to find white Southern Democrats. There aren't very many of them. Because of the redistricting in the states, they've really, legislatures in the South have really tend to concentrate African American strength in certain districts which reliably elect African Americans. And there's not a lot of place for white um, Southern Democrats anymore in the Congress. There are a few and you can almost count them on, on one hand. But I think there's always an interest in the um, Republicans to drive a wedge and make some very difficult votes for those conservative Southern Democrats and moderately conservative Democrats that live elsewhere. Um, the Democratic caucus, I think, and it kind of follows your pre preceding question, um, as the Republicans did when they were in the minority, the Democrats in the minority have actually hung together much, much better than the Democrats did when they were in the majority, when we fought ourselves much harder than we fought the Republicans, quite frankly. Um, and, you know, you see that there's a, um, on budget matters, the Democrats now sound like fiscal conservatives. And the, the budget position of Democrats, the big global budget position of Democrats now is kind of driven by the blue dog Democrats, which are the conservative budget hawks. They pretty much set budget policy for House Democrats now. So there's been an effort, even though Nancy Pelosi, who runs the House Democratic Caucus, is thought of as very liberal, I think she's actually done quite a good job of trying to ensure no more than one or two or three or four Democrats bolt on any given issue. It's easier when you're in the minority to do that. It's harder when you're governing, governing to do that. Oh.